Hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, apologies for, for the delay. We had some troubleshooting issues and uh, uh, EU Commissioner Virginia Sinkiewicz will be joining us uh, via audio versus video. Uh, welcome him. Uh, and good afternoon to our audience in Europe. Uh, my name is Milda Boyce, uh, Director of Transatlantic Leadership at the Center for European Policy Analysis in Washington, DC. I'd like to welcome everyone to our virtual fireside chat, which is part of CEPA's ongoing efforts to inform policy community and general public about Europe's response to the crisis in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we're speaking with the EU Commissioner, His Excellency Virginius Sinkiewicz, uh, whose main portfolio is environment, ocean, and fisheries. Uh, but today, we're going to talk about EU's economic recovery strategy with a focus of um, innovative and sustainable measures. Welcome, it's really great having you today and we appreciate you taking the time up, out of your busy schedule uh, to speak with us. Uh, before we jump uh, to the discussion, a quick note to, uh, for the audience tuning in on Zoom, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit questions to the commissioner. If you're following us on Twitter, please send your questions to C under a live video feed with a hashtag common crisis and we will try to loop in your questions to the discussion. Without further ado, I'd like to ask a, a first question. Uh, Mr. Sienkiewicz, the European Union is determined to turn the coronavirus crisis into an opportunity to invest in a future that is green and digital. At the core of this ambitious strategy, we have a European Green Deal the new circular economy action plan and biodiversity strategy. With these three pillars, European Union puts a strong emphasis not only on supporting recovery, but also boosting businesses, creating jobs and fostering digitalization. So given the complexity of this strategy, could you please help us understand and elaborate what will all these initiatives look like in real life? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, good afternoon to everyone uh, and apologies for uh, technical hiccup, uh, which unfortunately we experienced and I could join only via audio, but I hope that uh, you will be able to hear me, uh, hear me clear and, 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 and of course, uh, main messages will get through. So speaking about the EU Green Deal, uh, first of all, so the Green Deal uh, addresses uh, a generational challenge to halt and uh, revise the decline of biodiversity, which is particularly severe on farmland. Farmers will be the ones, the first ones to suffer from soil degradation, water scarcity, pollinators disappearance. And if we do not tackle this crisis, this requires a transformation of the way we produce food and, and, and manage our land. The Biodiversity 2030 strategy is a central element of the European Union's recovery plan. It will strengthen agroecosystem, facilitate biological pest control and climate adaptation, which cuts down on production costs and move towards greater sustainability. And a higher uh, share of organic production means better prices for farmers, so it is possible to combine profitability and sustainability. What's most important, we estimate that uh, it could uh, represent a competitive first mover advantage for our farmers in the medium term. And uh, our estimation that the global level of uh, sustainable food systems can create new economic value of more than 1.8 trillion uh, um, euros. Speaking uh, about other key initiatives uh, uh, like um, Circular Economy Action Plan, uh, first of all, uh, we take the Green Deal as the Europe's uh, growth strategy. And uh, Circular Economy Action Plan will be looking at the key economic sector, uh, strengthening uh, their resilience, but most importantly, of course, uh, by let's say reaching double target by decreasing pressure on uh, uh, on environment but also uh, building resilience here inside domestically in Europe uh, by creating a secondary raw materials market 
uh, by, of course, importing less uh, material from the third countries, uh, which showed very clearly that 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 unfortunately that uh, mm, EU have been during this crisis exposed quite a lot, and 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 uh, global supply chains didn't didn't work properly. Thank you so much for the answer. So just uh, building on what you said about the European Green Deal and growth and resilience, uh, could you elaborate a little bit more, um, especially given that um, there are high environmental restrictions on businesses under European Green Deal? Will, they, um, will the businesses be able to compete in the world markets uh, given these restrictions and how it will stimulate growth and resilience in the EU? First of all, I think that uh, we should be very proud of, of our uh, standards, uh, which uh, ensures uh, not only that uh, we produce the highest quality products, but also that uh, uh, it also uh, have huge impact on, the, on, the, on uh, our citizens' health. And I think uh this is this is the key uh, advantage which we have uh, of course we, uh, we take we we take the the balanced approach which uh, of course not overburdening uh, our businesses but on the other hand as well we should take uh, the climate change and environmental challenges uh, very seriously the european green deal is also uh, about uh, pushing uh, businesses to innovate and with support from investment and innovation programs of uh, the EU budget, the industry will be encouraged to develop new uh, market leading environmentally friendly technologies and uh, sustainable solutions. For example, the uh, SME strategy for a sustainable and digital Europe, among other measures uh, supporting SMEs for CC green tech investment initiative to pool funding from the EU member states and the private sector to help SMEs develop and adopt uh, green tech solutions. At least 300 uh, million euros of funding is already available to, to encourage uh, breakthrough green deal uh, innovations under the European Innovation Council Accelerator. In addition, the move to a more circular economy and increasing the market uh, in, in, as I mentioned, in secondary raw materials should improve the situation of industry relying on critical raw materials. And uh, the innovations uh, and solutions uh, that businesses develop first in the EU will improve their productivity and competitiveness globally and will make uh, the European Union's economy more independent from resources import, more resilient, not only to climate and environmental related risks, but, but also to, to supply shocks. Uh, and. Uh, here again, uh, shifting towards higher environmental standards, it's uh, the choice we made. Of course, the change will affect some sectors stronger than others. For example, pollution and energy intensive sector will need uh, assistance during the transition uh, when the economy moves away from polluting activities and towards cleaner production processes. But uh, the industrial strategy uh, addresses those concerns, and I'm truly happy that under the Green Deal, uh, we have a new industrial strategy which is completely in line. And in the context of uh, climate policy, the EU has already in place rules to prevent the relocation of economic activity to countries, regions with less ambitious uh, climate policies. These rules operate as part of the emissions trading system and give free emission allowances to industries at risk of carbon leakage. And in addition, the Green Deal announced that the Commission will look at possible border adjustment mechanism as an alternative to such free allocation under the emission trading system. And the EU will also continue to press uh, the need for sustainability in its free trade agreements and has uh, recently established a compliance officer to assess adherence to such provisions uh, by uh, our partners. 
so this is really interesting what you've been talking about and you kind of touched upon some key words um, that um, I wanted to follow up on, especially um, uh, global reach. Um, and for, first, before we get to, to that follow-up question, I would like to ask whether um, you will receive full-fledged support from its member states. Are there any divisions? Uh, do all the EU member sta states support this, this deal in order to be uh, implemented and successful? I'm uh, very encouraged that um, in the Council, uh, Green Deal uh, was supported uh, unanimously. Uh, but most importantly, we also see that this is a, a unique uh, uh, opportunity window which is created uh, by, the, by the Europeans, uh, who uh, uh, over uh, almost 90% uh, of them, who says very clearly uh, that uh, they are in favor of the Green Deal and they want us to act on uh, climate change even more actively than we do. And the Commission, of course, uh, intends to provide uh, the member states with tailor-made recommendations, taking into account uh, the specific objective of the future Green Deal target. The member states will be asked to translate the key union targets into explicit uh, national targets, which are going to be monitored and measured. And the Commission will ca carefully check if the recommendation are well uh, incorporated in the member states' uh, strategic planning. Uh, what's, most, uh, what's more important that uh, even so that the Green Deal was announced before the COVID-19 outbreak, when uh, the European Council met, uh, they actually asked the Commission to come up with the uh, recovery package, uh, which uh, would draft how the Europe's economy will rebuild after the, the, the shock. And uh, two major strands, which uh, two major directions which were chosen uh, by the Council was uh, exactly the green transition and digital. So you mentioned one of the words that I would like to piggyback off of. Uh, I see some questions already coming in, but before we switch gears, I'd like to, uh, to ask you um, a question about digitalization process. So we're talking about, um, in terms of digitalization, and we're talking about connectivity and especially the rapid deployment of 5G networks. So is there a strategy to attract investment from the EU and increase EU's, uh, US, I'm sorry, United States role and uh, um, attracting investment from the US tech industry, which would not only build um, capabilities, emerging technological capabilities, but also help strengthen the cohesion of the transatlantic alliance and that way deterring investments from uh, authoritarian regimes like China and its 5G technologies. I think uh, all, uh, first of all, uh, there is a strategy on 5G development uh, here uh, in the EU, uh, which uh, very clearly sets uh, uh, sets the way uh, European Union is going to go forward with the with the uh, implementation of the the 5G uh, network with the with the with the growth of 5G network, and of course uh, European Union has uh, very strict rules on on data protection and protection of its citizens' rights. Uh, uh, not uh, so. There is nothing more important than the freedoms and, and, and the rights of, 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 of our citizens. And, and of course, you will be uh, holding this position quite strictly, uh, but nevertheless, it's not going to limit investments uh, from abroad. I think they are happening and uh, as, as they were happening before. Uh, there is a broad opportunities in, in all member states uh, for companies' uh, development and a very favorable environment for investment. And I think uh, this is a way uh, is going to be continued, knowing that the record amount of public uh, money is going to be investment, invested into digital transitions. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Commissioner. So uh, we have uh, questions from the audience. And first one comes from Mr. Peter Borisov. Um, are, 
are there any outreach programs to provide assistance to Ukraine in terms of coronavirus recovery under the European Green Deal? There are several Ukrainian innovations that could be useful in Europe. Could you say a few words about that? So Commission worked very actively with the Ukraine and uh, I think the latest amount which uh, uh, which uh, was uh, uh, latest amount, uh, uh, I think, was one and a half billion uh, additional support to to Ukraine uh, in in the context of of, of the uh, rebuilding after the COVID-19. Of course, uh, we continue our active partnership under the Eastern uh, Partnership Project. Thank you so much. The next question comes from um, Davide Zalona. Um, I have having a question about the F2F strategy. Uh, does the commission plan legally binding targets, for example, 50% reduction of pesticides in every member state? Or will they only take the form um, of suggestions in the CAP strategic plan submitted by member states? So uh, targets uh, in, in farm to fork strategy at the moment, uh, they are not legally binding. And if Commission will proceed with any legally binding targets, uh, they will have to undergo impact assessment first. Uh, what Commission plans already to go in 2021 with the legally binding target on um, environment restoration. Uh, but again, uh, also this target will be impact uh, assessed so that the member states would have a full picture uh, before uh, taking uh, co-decision the, in the council. Thank you so much. So also following up on, on this question, um, given the stronger regulations on EU products, um, uh, making the economy more protective from imports because other states will not be able to reach same level of technolo technological requirements, for example. So will smaller states, um, uh, member states, will be able to export um, to countries like Germany uh, that will not be harmed because of stronger regulations and higher technological requirements in the production process? Uh, EU operates in, uh, in, a, in a fully open market and uh, trade uh, among uh, member states is not restricted and there is nothing uh, sort of new developments uh, foreseen uh, in this regard. And uh, I think uh, what's more, uh, there is a uh, huge opportunities for uh, not only speaking about small member states, but probably speaking about the SMEs first, uh, who will be able to access uh, uh, funding uh, for, for their projects, especially when we speak about the green transition uh, it's usually uh, taken into as a sort of more expensive transition where some of these solutions are still quite expensive and, and, and uh, for, for the SMEs especially. I think now with the public money being invested into economies, it's a, it's a, um, a unique opportunity to actually foster that transition and help uh, small and medium enterprises to, to develop, to access those uh, technologies, to develop their research and innovation uh, capabilities. So Mr. Commissioner, so when are we gonna start seeing some of these projects uh, being implemented? Um, do we have to have all the EU member states on board um, in support of, of the, these initiatives? or we might be seeing some of this um, uh, being implemented sometime soon. And what are the biggest challenges that you foresee um, in the implementation process? I think we have all the EU member states uh, on board and of course uh, implementation and, and, and then to see results, uh, it takes time. But most importantly, I think and the biggest challenge is not to forget that the EU is not in a vacuum. And for us, it's extremely important uh, international agreement on uh, on uh, equally on equal uh, targets, so that um, climate change it respects no borders. And if you saw uh, Amazonia fires, you probably seen the bushfires in Australia or fires in Siberia, or recent uh, diesel leak in uh, Norilsk. So clearly, uh, climate change respects 
uh, no borders and uh, uh, the price of, of uh, inactiveness uh, will be much higher than price of, of, of acting. So I think it's, it's very important finding a global agreement uh, on, on, on targets and moving on implementation of them, uh, which will, of course, uh, uh, dramatically decrease uh, consequences of climate change. So one of my last questions, um, uh, where do you see more of um, the role of the United States? Where could U US, the, the, you know, the transatlantic community could come in and support the efforts carried out by, by the EU? I think there is uh, plenty areas, uh, speaking of, uh, uh, for example, uh, marine protected areas in the high seas, uh, protection of uh, oceans, uh, agreement on uh, biodiversity, ambitious uh, plants, um, developing green technologies, uh, switching to more renewable energy. I think those possibilities to partner is numerous and, uh, and I think they are going on. Um, Despite uh, of, of how it might look uh, from the public perspective, I, uh, I see many companies working together, uh, successfully de developing uh, decisions which are future-proof, uh, which are resilient uh, decisions, which are guaranteed to create new uh, resilient jobs on, on the both sides of the ocean. Uh, well, um, on that positive note, uh, we're running out of time. Um, if you, Mr. Commissioner, if you have any closing uh, remarks, uh, I'll, I'll give you your last word. Hey, first of all, thank you very much uh, for uh, having me. Uh, it was great to talk with you. Hopefully next time we'll be able to speak maybe in DC uh, or at least without the technological hiccup uh, uh, which unfortunately caused that I wasn't able to uh, to join you video, via video. Uh, but I think it, it was very good uh, discussion looking at the numerous possibilities which are there uh, for uh, uh, us, for the transatlantic cooperation. And I think environmental uh, diplomacy is, is the one where you can find uh, so many um, agreements uh, and, and, and move uh, ahead uh, very quickly with, uh, with the decisions which would, again, uh, they would create jobs, but more, um, uh, more, more important, that would uh, drastically decrease the pressure uh, uh, on our planet. Thank you so much, Mr. Commissioner. Thank you for your time. And on that positive note, uh, we'll wrap it up. Uh, thank you for joining us today and a big thanks to our virtual audience See you next time.